Hey everyone, James from Zygal Studios here. So today, as promised, we're going to be talking about the 3DO Portfolio Operating System. So now, the 3DO was something that was different in terms of the games industry. Previously, consoles would need to be well, licensed out for development kits, so game studios were able to make games for the console, and uh, licensing fees were typically pretty expensive. So much so that the margins on the games would close down, and maybe some game studios didn't find it a viable business venture to do business with this particular company. The idea from the 3DO model was to actually license out manufacturing to reduce licensing costs in developing games to make more developers want to develop games for it. Now, the real problem was, was that there was no viable business market on this side of things because the regular 3DO console ended up being too expensive due to licensing out manufacturing and making things more custom. Now, while there still were some good games that were developed for it, clearly there was a gap. Was it a risk? Yes. And sometimes risks that you take don't always end up in a positive result. But something cool did come out of this, and this is the portfolio operating system. So the 3DO, since it had well, just general system specifications that these manufacturing companies needed to adhere to, it was able to have potentially different hardware as long as it had the same requirements and system blocks that were required from the 3DO license agreement. So this means that you could potentially have different hardware doing the same stuff, but the real problem was, how did you ensure that games were going to work from console to console? That was kind of tricky, right? Well, thankfully, the creators of the 3DO made an operating system, which was really rare for the time, something totally different. It was all written in C, for the most part, with some assembly. And this allowed for a lot of the hardware to be abstracted away, and also preemptive multitasking was able to be used. With that being said, let's get started. Let's talk about what an operating system actually is. So you might know what an operating system is because you use one every day. Whether it's Windows, Linux, or Mac OS, You've probably used one of these three or all three in your entire lifetime. So you have an idea. You can open programs, you can run different things, and you can have multiple things open at the same time. Fundamentally, even though these three are so different from one another, they all are built off the same fundamental building blocks. They're just implemented differently. And while some have more in other areas and others may not, they still have the same building blocks as one another. Operating systems have a whole mess of different features and can be as complicated or as simple as you want them. But typically, they're broken down into a few basic key components. You need a way to access your devices, your hardware, things like hard drives, USB devices, or other auxiliary input-output devices, also known as I.O. You also need a way to be able to create tasks and timeshare between them. You need a way to schedule when a task is complete and how to switch between those two tasks. This is what's known as a scheduler. But as you might imagine, the scheduler can't just predict or t read your mind in terms of what tasks need to run. The programmer needs to specify those, and there needs to be a construct in order to do so. These are what's known as threads. So a thread has a few main key components. It can have more, but the basics are this. A function pointer for the update loop, meaning the beginning of the scope and the end of scope of this particular thread will execute when the scheduler says this task is active. It'll also have an area of memory for the stack of the thread and its thread context, which includes an area of memory to save all the registers that it was using during its time so it can switch them when the scheduler gives it the OK again. Now really from a high level, we can think about threads as almost separate programs that run under one roof, and this roof would be the operating system, and the master of puppets that pulls the strings is going to be the scheduler. The scheduler will be able to tell when these different threads are able to stop or start. And as you can imagine, there are numerous ways to accomplish this problem. You could do something as simple as a round robin routine where we share time equally throughout the system, or we can have a more complicated approach to systems that have hard timing deadlines. And what I mean by hard timing deadlines is I mean tasks that need to be processed immediately. In this case, we use something called preemption, and it's a way to order your threads by priority so that if one is operating and there's a higher priority one that has an interrupt generated or spawned, that that one with the higher priority operates at exactly that moment in time. When is this useful? A simple example would be an airbag module. When a car crashes, it can happen at any time when the system's operating. This means that the task of the airbag needs to be at highest priority because it needs to be on a strict timing deadline. If the airbag doesn't deploy because we're time sharing on some other task, 
Well, you've basically just ruined your feature. You don't have an airbag anymore, and somebody can get seriously hurt. A more sinister thing that could even happen is let's say we catch an opposite end of an update loop, meaning that the airbag deploys later than it should. In that case, things can be even more disastrous. You could potentially kill someone. So you need to ensure that these deadlines, this hard deadline, these tasks execute immediately, and they happen right now. And in the case of the 3DO, that's exactly what it uses, is a preemptive system. These threads are assigned priorities, and the thread with the highest priority will always trump all the ones lower than it. So now with this preemptive model, can you think of any examples in video games where this would be particularly helpful? I certainly can. When thinking about our tasking model, we need to think about things that need to happen at specific times. If we're designing a game on the 3DO, let's shoot for 30 frames per second. This means every 33.333 milliseconds, some information and data needs to be sent to the video hardware to the frame buffer in order for it to be displayed on screen. So what you could do, potentially, is have an interrupt that is generated every 33.33 milliseconds from a timer, and then at this point, a thread can execute and send all the information that you have in memory needed for the frame buffer and pipe it to the video hardware. I'm not saying this is the best way to approach this problem, but this is certainly one way you can do it. Another would be audio. Audio needs to happen at a specific time in order to sound correct, otherwise you can end up with some pretty nasty artifacts inside the audio itself or just missing audio in general. So what do you do? You set up tasks that have a specific priority that can execute at a specific time interval that the audio is supposed to run at. These are just a couple ways to use the preemptive system inside of a console in order to make a game run smoothly. In some cases, with all these separate modules, there needs to be a manager over everything in order to make sure that things are abstracted correctly and are operating normally as well. This is what's known as a kernel, and in the case of the 3DO portfolio, it's also here. It handles the scheduler, memory management tool, communication between tasks, resource sharing modules, different data structures, error codes and other miscellaneous information about the operating system, as well as input-output access. All of these are managed under the kernel, and the way the kernel is abstracted to the programmer is through what's called folios. Folios are the system API for the portfolios, and the kernel essentially manages the creation, the disposal, the loading and unloading of these folios. So at this point, the programmer has a nice level of, of abstraction to complete their tasks. Now I'm not going to go too much into detail on any one of these folios and parts of the system because let's be honest, each one of these could get their an, an entire video dedicated to it. But something cool that the 3DO portfolio had was its own file system and it was known as the file folio. It allowed you to work with things like non-volatile RAM or NovRAM, have a directory system, and even have byte stream file access like FileIO and C. There was even a separate folio to determine language, country, how to display dates, currency, and numeric values to make sure everything was consistent with the standard of the country that it was in. This was known as the international folio. That's genius, because at the end of the day, this needs to be a demand-based system, right? We need to know how to display a bunch of different things so games don't have to worry about managing all that. You can just call the folio that handles all of that stuff for you. The IO architecture model followed a more modern approach. You basically have three layers of abstraction. You have the device, the driver, and the IO request that handles through the event brokerage system through that folio. Now from the device side, a software device doesn't always correspond to a specific hardware device. It's basically just anything that can request I.O. from a particular space and memory. The drivers are the ways that these devices can communicate with, with either other devices or areas of memory in order to be used. For example, if I'm trying to pull something off of the disk, I'll issue an I.O. request through the event system. The driver will then take that request with the size offset, retrieve it from the specified device, and dump it in memory, or another device. Under the hood, all of this stuff can be done through different hardware, so you can see why abstracting this was necessary from the portfolio perspective and why it was such a great idea. The programmer doesn't have to worry about all these little intricacies, they just know that I need to get 8 bytes off of the disk. So what do you do? You request it through the I.O. event request. And the drivers will handle the device selection and all the data transfer going back and forth and you'll have that memory that you requested in your buffer before you know it. The portfolio used something called items to handle all different kinds of shared resources. And these items would basically just be structs that had owners, different flags, and other things that were able to be shared between multiple folios. 
On the graphics side of things, the graphics folio used something called the cell engine. And a cell, or, or CEL, consists of three parts. Source data that contains pixel values for the cell itself. A preamble that contains information about the format of the source data. And a CCB that specifies how the cell is projected onto the screen or a bitmap. The CCB is essentially a collection of values that are stored in hardware registers of the cell engine. Each of these values control a different aspect of the cell engine operation. These CCB values could be changed in order to change the way things were projected on screen. Maybe in another video, I can get into more detail about how the cell engine operates and more about how the graphics folio is used. But overall, this was the basic idea. I really hope you all enjoyed this video. Be sure to leave a like if you did, and if you liked what you watched, please be sure to subscribe because there will be more content coming in the future. If there's anything you want to share with me about future video topics or any feedback you want to provide, please leave it in the comment section below. I'd be happy to read it and take a look at it. Thank you again for all the wonderful support, and this is James from Zygel Studios, signing off.